questions do you ask so that when you leave there, you have a pretty good idea how you're going to build the system based on what they want. You've got a pretty good idea of, of um, how big the system needs to be, um, uh, any sort of uh, um, upgrades that can be done. It, it, when you leave there, you can create a bill of materials and you can create a design for them and pretty much cover all of their needs. So qualifying a job is um, extremely important. Um, and then from that, um, I always like to start system designing from qualifying the job and then start right away looking in into speakers that, that fit the space. And once I start working on those two, the rest of the system kind of falls into place and that's kind of what we'll go through. So um, the other part of qualifying a job is you may uncover something that that customer didn't even realize they needed. Um, uh, you know, the space that you're talking about, maybe there's bathrooms that need audio, maybe there's a patio that needs audio. So you can use this as also a potential upsell um, when you're talking with your clients. Um, so if you take a particular space and now you've qualified the job and you're kind of laying it out, um, you've got your bar, you've got your lobby, you've got your outdoors uh, where people enter the building, you have your restaurant area. So if you take this typical floor plan um, and you decide, you know, I think I want to do stereo and I want to do an 8-ohm system because the, the customer wants to hear an 8 ohm system because they're afraid that the 70 volt won't sound as good, right? This is what it would look like if you did it 8 ohms. So, or what we've referred to as the low Z method. So, you'd have a central location where your amplifiers would be, and you would need uh, a lot of amplifiers to power the system. Not to mention, you're going to have to use a heavier gauge wire um, to go the distance. Uh, your your wire pulling and your wire expense go up. So if you were to say in an eight, it would take you eight hours to pull a thousand feet. Um, you're using about 950 feet of wire. Um, so and it's pretty complex. You got to keep track of what all those home runs would be. So now let's look at it. If you use a a high Z method or what we call constant voltage uh, method, 70 volts. You've got three amp channels. Um, so here's, here's a good question um, that can be, can be asked that maybe some of you might know. What is considered a zone? How would you know when you're talking with your customer, how would you know what a zone would be? So that's something to think about and I'll come back to that later on. So obviously you can see in an eight hour per thousand feet of wire, you're using about 450 feet of wire. So you can see your labor to pull that wires a lot cheaper. Um, and literally, if you're if you were to pull that wire across that bar in the top part of the screen, you would just do one wire pull, and then where you want to place the speaker in that ceiling, you would come up to it, cut that wire in half, terminate the two ends into the speaker and then go to your next one. So it makes it really quick to do your installs. Um, let's talk a little bit about the bidding process. You're qualifying a job, you're creating your bill of materials. Um, some things, protect yourself. Because the last thing you wanna do is do all this work and, and then have somebody just have you do all the work and then shop it with somebody else who could do it cheaper. Uh, and and Customers will do that. Your end users will actually just take your take your bill of materials and hand it to somebody else and say, what could you do it for? So learn how to protect yourself on this. And as you can see, we're, we're looking at, you know, item description where we're absolutely calling out the manufacturer and the part numbers. And then the prices of what we, we would buy it for and what our, our upgrade would, you know, our markup would be. So Get in the habit of just either if you have to line item it, you know, do your 4800 lumen, do your uh, do your HDMI receiver, 
um, and then subtotal it at the end. Uh, you can even go as far as projector system, 2,500 bucks, right? I think somebody is unmuted. Hold on a second. I'll check real quick. I have everybody muted. We'll see what happens here. And at first, I thought it was me just looping back, <laughs> but that's fine. Hey, can we get some audio people on that? To mute that. <laughs> and since we're all audio talking, so get into get into the habit of of removing anything that would create an argument or allow that end user to shop it. Um, you probably already know this, but it's really also I like to put it in here because it's really good to, um, especially for. For some people that are maybe entering um, into the audio video world um, from uh, from previous, you know, I, I deal with a lot of residential folks that come into the commercial world um, that now actually are using commercial products in residential. So it's it's really cool, and it never hurts to diversify yourself and. I deal with security folks that, that have been asked for years to put in audio gear and, and now they are. And so this is just good practice when you're, you know, you're not trying to cheat your customer, but you are trying to just protect yourself from doing all this work and up front and then having somebody steal it from you for, you know, a few, a few hundred or a thousand dollars or a few thousand dollars less than what you would do it for. So, um, off my soapbox on that. So, Low impedance, low Z is the industry term. What is it? What is it? So it, it, it basically refers to when you have an 8-ohm speaker and you hook it up to an amplifier, that's your load, right? So typically on a home, home, home theater system, you've got your, you know, your Harman Kardon uh, receiver amp that's like a 7.2, um, and on the back of it is your are your amp outputs and you connect it to it and so you take an 8 ohm speaker connected to it it's an 8 ohm load take two 8 ohm speakers and connect it to that same amp channel now you're a 4 ohm load connect three you'll be at about 2.66 ohms connect four 8 ohm speakers now you're going to be around two ohms um, and, and that load, uh, you really have to make sure that the amplifier you're using, A, will actually function at 2 ohms. A lot of amplifiers, specifically residential, will do 4 ohms, maybe. Uh, 2 ohms, probably not. Um, to keep an amplifier running stable at 2 ohms requires some, some technology. So, um, And then, obviously, if you were to connect a fifth 8 ohm speaker you're pretty much getting close to a dead short so uh, uh, load balancing is key and that's what we're talking about um, how many 8 ohm speakers can you put on an amp channel before things start smoking um, uh, it requires a larger gauge wire um, so you, you, it's a higher cost to run further distance um, I used to when I was an integrator working for a company called AT, ATK Audio Tech um, I helped build almost 500 Apple stores globally. Um, and believe it or not, all the Apple stores that I installed were actually 8 ohm stores. We did not do 70 volt in there, but we were using 10 gauge wire to run 100 feet. So um, it was something that was decided by Apple uh, early on in 2000 to say, no, we want to run this 8 ohm. Uh, we are doing what we call a stereo input that does a summed mono, uh, which we'll go through later on, but uh, uh, that's uh, it's an interesting little point. Um, so what is 70 volt? Let's get into it. So 70 volt um, and 100 volt and 140 volt systems typically are what we call constant voltage systems, right? So we're using a constant voltage to send it down, down a cable that hits a transformer in the speaker and gets converted to the wattage that the speaker is set at, right? So we'll, let's get into it. Uh, 25 volt systems, you may run into these um, in, in a school district uh, that may still have an old system from the 70s <laughs> uh, installed. Um, but uh, 70 volt systems basically is where you'll run 
to a certain length and then you'll step it up to 100 volts for, for longer lengths in the 1,000 feet. Um, 140 volts is if you bridge uh, an amplifier that's uh, set at 70 volt. It'll double it and make it 140 volts. You have to be careful with 100 vo 140 volts when you bridge an amp because typically you might run into some um, uh, some issues with code um, on on that. All right, so simply speaking, we all live in a house or an apartment or a condo, right? And we have somewhere in the city a huge power power of um, power grid, right? That's bringing high voltage into the city and it's sending it down the line to your house. And then maybe if you've got telephone poles outside your house, you've got those transformers that you see, right? So it's taking constant voltage, high constant voltage, hitting it to a transformer and that transformer bumps it down into the power that your house can actually handle, correct? So that's a really good way to look at a 70 volt system. Um, on the bottom, you've got these six way plugs. So you have to be mindful of what each one of these plugs is drawing, okay? So if for some reason you look at it and all five of these are getting really close to the full wattage uh, that, that the line, that the circuit breaker can handle, and then you plug a hair dryer in, what's gonna happen? You're gonna pop the circuit, right? Or, or things are gonna start dimming and flickering, right? So you have to be mindful of the same way in 70 volt to where you know exactly how many speakers you have on an amp channel line and what each tap setting is of that speaker. You add those taps up and you have to make sure that those, that the total of those taps equals to about 80% of what the amplifier total wattage is, right? So if you have a hundred watt amplifier, uh, you need to be no more than about 80 watts. Um, and we'll get into a little bit of, of why you would leave that room today, why you would leave that 20% or 10%. So this is what a typical um, high Z system would look like. You come out of your amplifier, go to your first speaker, come out of that first speaker, go to your second speaker. You can even get creative like this picture shows you and branch off. Um, and uh, it makes it real easy to do your systems. Literally, you just run your run your 16 gauge wire and cut it in half where you want to put a speaker and connect it. Makes it really quick for your install. Another advantage to a 70 volt system is you're able to, no matter what the ceiling height is, you're able to use different uh, power settings um, depending on your ceiling height so that when you are standing at at listening height, you get the same um, SPL, sound pressure level, or loudness, if you will. You'll get that same one if you're standing underneath a 20-foot ceiling or if you're standing under a 9-foot ceiling. You can make the sound even uh, no matter what the ceiling height is. Make sense? And I'm going to show you how, how you calculate that. So here's what we're going to do. We're going to do the long form. Is anybody familiar with inverse square law? I know it sounds scary, but it's not. It's really simple, it's really easy. And I wanna show you how to do the long method because you're not always able to use uh, calculators that, that I'm gonna show you. Um, this inverse square law can be calculated from ceiling to floor. So like when you put your ceiling speakers in and listen at listening height, you can also calculate it um, from standing away from it. So if you've got a performance, you know, you've got speaker set up on a stage and you want to see what your, your signal loss, what your SPL level is going to be in the front of the room to the back of the room, you can use uh, inverse square law for that. So basically, what is inverse square law? Inverse square law says every time I double my distance away from that speaker, I lose 6 dB of, of, of sound pressure level, right? In order to get that 6 dB back, if I double my watt, I get 3 dB back. 
So I would have to double my watts again to get 6 dB. So it's really kind of not fair that when you double your distance away from the, from the speaker, you lose 6 dB, but in order to get it back, you have to double the wattage twice to get that back. So let's take a look at what that looks like. And by the way, they use this also in lighting. Um, because every time you double your distance away from light, you lose in the equal amount of 6 dB in lumens. I'm not a lighting guy, so that's uh, we'll have to figure that one out later together. <laughs> so so um, now we're going to use uh, Control 29 AV. That is a surface mount speaker that, yes, can be mounted uh, on the ceiling pointing down if you wanted to. I've, I've done it um, and helped people do it before. Um, but here's the point. No matter what manufacturer speaker you are looking at, um, and a lot of times you're going to be asked to come in and redo an existing system where the client's going to say, you, you need to use these speakers. I don't want to change the speakers. I just want to change the head unit, right? You still need to do this math. Um, to be able to know what your SPL levels are going to be at listening height and to know what amplifiers you're going to change out, right? So every manufacturer should have in their specs a nominal sensitivity rating. So, and what does that mean? That means uh, in this particular case that this speaker will produce 90 dB at one watt at one meter. So in other words, if I put one watt into this speaker and I stand 3.3 feet away from that speaker, I will hear on average 90 dB. Does that make sense? Pretty simple. And no matter what manufacturer your speaker you're looking at, they will always have a nominal sensitivity or a sensitivity level. I know people play around with the terminologies, but you look for that, specifically the one watt, one meter, and that's what you're going to use as your reference to do the math. So let's take a scenario with a control 29 AV. So we have a we have a bar sports bar application. The ceiling is open and it's 16 feet high to the deck. OK, patrons are seated. That's important because you need to figure out what your listening height is going to be. Now, when you're qualifying a job, something that you're going to look for is, is everybody seated in chairs or is everybody seated on stools or is there a combination of both? Because that's going to help you determine your height, right? So 16 feet, let's call listening height at about three feet. Um, I typically use four feet, but for this, we're going to use three feet. So 16 feet minus three feet for your listening height. So a seated patron is going to be about 13 feet. So now we're going to take about two feet off because of how the speaker mounts from the front of that grill uh, to, the, to, the, to the deck. It's about two feet. So now we're sitting at 11 feet. So our goal um, and this is another where, place that you're going to have to qualify the job is to figure out what the club owner or the bar owner, or the restaurant owner, or the end user, how loud do they need it to be? Um, which brings up another thing. What's the ambient noise in that room when there's nothing going on? Is it concrete floors? Is it open ceiling? Is it is there a lot of metal in there? Is there a lot of glass in there? You have to be able to determine um, what that ambient level is going to be. And then you're going to shoot for 15 to 20% above uh, what that ambient noise is uh, as, your, as your target goal for continuous sound. Make sense? So, hey, David. David, yes. this is Stacey. We do have a question from the audience that I want to throw Bring out there. Bring it. Yes. What's the best way to determine which gauge to use? Is that a manufacturer specified? I'm going to attempt. Uh, I'm, I'm going to get into that. I have a, I have a couple of, of slides for that coming up. So, so hold tight. I got it. 16 gauge is pretty much the standard and I'll show you why. Okay. Make sense. 
Stacy, you're awesome. Thank you so much. And and please don't hesitate to interrupt. That's what this is about. This is about um, learning uh, what it, what's in my crazy head and being able to help you on any of your projects. So um, I, I bet you um, most people that might be on this call that are installers probably have 16 gauge on their truck um, as a standard. So, and I'll show you, I've got a, I've got a, uh, a graph that shows you why 16 gauge is so popular. Okay, so 90 dB, 11 feet. We remember that our nominal sensitivity is 90 dB at one watt me one meter. But how do I get that uh, 90 dB at, a, at 11 feet from the speaker? So I'm gonna show you how to do it. So this, this is our goal. So 90 dB at one watt one meter at the deck. When I double my distance away, I'm at 6.6 6 feet away. I take 6 dB off because inverse square law says when I double my distance, I lose 6 dB. So now I'm at 84 dB. So when I double my distance again, I take 6 dB off and now I'm at about 13.2 feet and 78 dB. That's if I put one watt into that control 29 AV. If I put one watt into it and I'm sitting at three feet, I'm at 78 dB. Make sense? So now, how do I get that 78 dB to 90 dB? How many watts do I need to put into that speaker to get there? So 78 dB at one watt, I double my watt, I get three dB back, because that's how inverse square law works. Um, I'm at 81 dB. I double my watt again from two to four. Now I'm at 84. Double it again to eight watts, I'm at 87 and I double it again to 16 watts, now I'm at 90 dB. So what's, what's our tap setting? Our tap setting on that speaker to get 90 dB should be 16 watts. So now what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna go back to the spec of that speaker and find out what their tap settings are and find the closest one. So the lowest tap setting on the Control 29 is 14 watts. So you tap it up one. So now I'm at 28 watts. And what did I do? Now I bought myself some headroom because I know that my target was 90 dB, but my speaker's gonna be tapped at 28 watts. Now I have some headroom. Does it make sense? So I showed you how to do it the long way so that I could show you how to do it this way. <clears throat> this is our distributed system design software. And Stacy, let me know if you're seeing the gray. <laughs> I want to make yep. sure you guys can see this. Okay, perfect. This, this is a software that is free on our JBL website. It's called Distributed System Design. And so what we're going to do is we're going to create a new design. And we'll call it bar. Okay. And then we're going to put in our length and width. Let's do 50 feet. Hmm. By 25 feet. Now it works in, in squares and rectangles. Um, and then our ceiling height at 12 feet. Okay. So now what we're going to do is um, based on our qualifying the job, right? We're going to qualify the job and we're going to scroll through here. Now it does have all of our, um, all of our JBL install speakers listed. So you're able to go through here and let's pick a speaker. Let's do a control 26 CT. We'll do a 60 watt tap. And then uh, you've got an option to do square array or hexagonal, hexagonal array. Um, square array is just that. All of your rows are even and all your columns are even. So your, your, um, your ceiling is laid out at a grid really nice and even. Hexagon, you're going to stagger the rows, and I'll show you what these look like uh, coming up. You're going to stagger the rows a little bit and use this as your last resort for when you're trying to value engineer a project and you're trying to maybe cut down a couple of speakers but still maintain the same coverage. You would choose a hexagon pattern, or if you've got some rounded areas, you're trying to uh, do some, you know, some calculations with um, you know, bars and restaurants and places that have 
maybe different shapes um, that you're trying to cover. So try a hexagon pattern to see if it'll fit in there a little better. Um, and then you have different coverage patterns. So what we're talking about in coverage patterns is there is, um, uh, typically I start with edge to edge. And what that means is the conical coverage pattern of that speaker, um, when it gets down to listening height that we have set for four feet here, um, the next speaker's conical pattern will end where that where the speaker to the left or right of it ends. Does it make sense? That's what edge to edge means. And then minimum overlap is exactly that. It kind of overlaps. Um, each speaker kind of overlaps halfway um, into the next speaker. And then maximum overlap overlap is center of cone to center of cone. So you're overlapping. So you're going to get the, the most even coverage um, using maximum overlap. But let's see what Control 26 is doing in this room. So let me open this up for you so you guys can see it. So now it's telling me that I need three speakers in this space. And these numbers here say from this wall, I come in eight feet. And from this wall, I come in 12 and a half feet, right? And then I space out my speaker 17 feet. So it not only tells you how many speakers you would need in this room, but it also tells you where to put them. Now, keep in mind, HVAC and lighting and other objects in the ceiling might hinder you, but at least it'll get you close, right? So now it'll also tell me down here below, what's my maximum continuous SPL level? I'm at 95.7 dB. And then I can peak uh, based on pink, pink noise, 105, um, you know, 99 to 105 dB. I can actually push it. So it gives me my headroom. The coolest thing is it tells me how many watts I need. So how, how big my amplifier needs to be on one channel to be able to cover it. Or if it's too big for one amp channel, you can split it up. And now you can look at um, dividing up your speakers which, by the way, I haven't forgotten. Um, if you're thinking about what is a what is considered a zone when you're dealing with audio, um, so I have actually done layouts like this for customers, printed them out, and taken with taken them with me to do site walks, and I have won projects off of these because it shows you exactly what they're going to get. Um, so keep that in mind. So now we will come back to this. So this is what your coverage patterns look like. Your edge to edge, your minimum overlap, and your full overlap. Does it make sense? Now keep in mind, this is at whatever listening height you are setting. That, that ceiling speaker design software works at ceiling height. The math that it does, it takes all that inverse square law and it takes into, cap, into consideration the spec of the speaker you're choosing, and it will come up with um, within you know three or four dB variation of what your SPL levels will be at that listening height. Make sense? Okay, David. We have another question yes. from the audience. They would like bring it you, on. They would like for you to address outdoor speakers and placement. Oh, that's a good question. Um, there's a lot. There's a lot of variables when you're dealing with outdoor. Um, you have to consider where where that facility is in relation to residential. Um, you'll have to look at any sort of um, violations that might happen, like in a, in, in a mall situation. Um, there may be limitations on what they can do outside um, to not interrupt the common areas. Um, uh, so even before you start talking about what's the best speaker, you need to consider all of these other things that, that will come into play. Code. Um, also, you need to look at um, the spec of the speaker and what the IP rating is of that speaker to, um, to determine, can I put it in direct sunlight? Can I put it where it can get rained on? Um, will that IP rating be sufficient to do that? Is there any sort, sort of mounting requirement 
to maintain that IP rating. And some of our speakers, it's required to put a pitch on it, which we, you'll find in the specs. There are some, some of our outdoor speakers that if you don't put the required pitch, it could potentially fill up with water. Um, and I've, I've actually, last year we had um, some of our AWC speakers that, that um, they did not mount them correctly and they filled up with water. I believe we went ahead and replaced them anyway, but you just got to keep in mind and follow the spec of that particular speaker. And also look at, you have to look at where the club owner or where, where the, uh, the owner or, or manager of the place is going to be okay with them. A lot of times they, they want to be heard, not seen, that kind of thing. So I hope that kind of answers the questions and gets you at least started on uh, um, what you would ask, you know, initially. Um, I know that when I was building Apple stores um, in Italy, um, when we were building the Apple store in Roma, we were not allowed to use subs because where the speakers were getting mounted was in an open space above the ceiling. And from store to store, it was open. So sound was able to pass through. So we weren't, we weren't able to put subs in. Um, a, a little footnote on that is um, they ended up uh, approving it at the end of the day. So we had to open the ceiling up. It was a big thing because uh, if you know the Apple stores, that is a stretch fabric that has to be heated up and pulled into place. So it was kind of a nightmare to go back in and put subs in. But um, so hopefully that answers the question. If you, if you, need more details let me know so uh, we have yeah. we have some more questions sure uh, can we import and export gll files into this utility on that software no you can't but we do have a, a lot of our stuff we do have gll files for um like doing ease modeling yeah um we do have a lot of a lot of our um trap speakers and uh, column arrays we have files for those if you want to lay them into ease modeling so obviously, if you've got talent to do um, ease modeling or, or SketchUp, um, that kind of thing, that's, that actually is going to be, you know, even more detailed than what the ceiling speaker design software will do. Um, but that's a great question. That's awesome. Hey, so, we got some talent on the phone here. <laughs> yeah, so, um, the next question is, can you repeat where um, you can get the calculator again? Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. So if you go to jblpro.com and go to software, and then you're going to look for distributed system design. Uh, okay. It might even say DSD. Then the next thing I have is IP rating question mark. Those your the that is the outdoor rating, wh whether it can hold uh, withstand particles. Um, how much water it can withstand, how much sun it can withstand. Um, each speaker manufacturer um, has has specs on speakers that will tell you what the IP rating is. I don't know if it had it visible enough um, on the Control 25 that I had in here. Um, <clears throat> but um, um, and and obviously, if you want to talk further, um, Stacy's got my contact info. You can email me or call me. I love talking about this if you haven't already figured that out. So absolutely, Stacy, we can, um, I can help you steer you into, um, if you actually do a Google search for IP ratings, um, you'll see that there's, um, there's two numbers and the first number will tell you one thing and the second number will tell you another. Um, and depending on what that number is, there's a graph that you can go to. Okay, I got two more questions. I think you might have already answered this one, but I'm just going to repeat it. Are Harman okay. GLL files available? On some of our stuff, yes. I don't know about our ceiling speakers, um, but uh, a lot of our um, column arrays and point and shoot, our trap trapezoid speakers, um, some of our surface mount speakers will have it. Um, if there's a specific one you need, let me know. I can reach out to Rick Camlet and his team and see if he might have one. Um, something that JBL does that some other manufacturers don't is we have four anechoic chambers. So every speaker that we design and build is put into an anechoic chamber. And if you don't know what that is, that is a, a room that is completely, completely silent of any sort of outside noise. 
um, I usually call it the tinnitus check room because when you walk in there and they close the door, you can hear your you can hear your you can hear your heartbeat. You can hear your uh, tinnitus, the hissing in your ears. It almost feels like you're underwater. But we use those rooms to be able to mic the speakers and then put pink noise through it and tones through it to see how that speaker's producing with the cabinet that that the the, the cones and and drivers are sitting in. Um, so our specs are pretty accurate that way. So one last question: Are you going to address large-scale sound reinforcement systems? On this, n not really. But I am going to get into the difference between using stereo and mono uh, in a commercial environment. Um, we do actually offer um, through JBL. We are doing a lot of our uh, line array courses and. Um, uh, some of our large venue cor courses to teach you how to set up like uh, um, performance venues, concert venues. And then also if you do have um, a live situa uh, situation that you're trying to handle or deal with now, uh, hit me up uh, via email and I'll have all my info at the end of this um, so that you can see we can talk um, offline and we can go through it together. Perfect. Make sense? Cool. All right. So real quick, this is the, what the difference is between square, symmetrical, and hexagonal. So you could potentially drop a couple speakers off your design and save the customer some money by going to a hexagon pattern. Cool. I'm going to speed up a little bit because I think we have about 15 minutes left. So not only do you have to worry about doubling your distance away from a speaker if you're standing directly in front of it, but you also have to keep in mind your listening plane. You're start. You're going to start losing, uh, you know, 6 dB, 12 dB as you get off access of your speakers too, as well. Um, so your sound pressure level will decrease if you're off access. That is the reason why you want to make sure you're picking the right coverage pattern um, in 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 your designs. Cool. So we've already talked about 70 volts and how it's how it's a better solution when you're trying to distribute audio through a, uh, through a uh, large area, which is different than a residential, right? So this is just uh, showing you how how expensive 12 gauge copper is compared to a 16 gauge copper. So you're able to reduce your copper size and your price per thousand feet in half. Um, so remember we were talking about gauge wire. That was a question earlier. Why 16 gauge? Simply because you can still use 16 gauge in an eight ohm situation at about 50 feet, you're going to lose about 11% off of that. So if you need 200 Watts and you're running at 15 feet, you're going to lose 11% of that 200 Watts where you put that speaker. Make sense? Now, if you go over to 70 volt and you go 1300 feet, you're going to lose 11% at the end of that. Make sense? Now, the more speakers that you tap and, and connect in, in that line will actually have an effect on that, on your dB loss at the end of it. But I mean, how often are you doing a 1300 foot run? Make sense? So when you're in the 100, 200, 300 foot run, you're probably, you and I will not be able to hear the difference. It's still going to sound good. So this is also another key to make sure that, that you absolutely tap your speakers appropriately. Because um, remember, on a 70 volt system, 70 volts um, uh, clips, your amp will clip when it reaches 70 volts. So you have to keep in mind that if you want, on average, a five watt tap. So if you want five watts to come out of that speaker, you're probably going to have to tap your speakers around 30 watts to get that average um, of, of five watts per speaker. And we can go into that. I've got uh, another presentation we can do at another time that kind of goes into that detail. Um, but again, you can see why 16 gauge is very popular to use for not only an 8-ohm situation for short runs, but also for 
um, 70 volt run for over a thousand feet. So we have a question. What voltage yeah. do you usually tap the transformer at in a 70 volt system? Ha ha. So basically when we were going through that control 29, right? You, you use inverse square law to figure out how many Watts you need to tap that speak that, that speaker at, uh, in order to get that SPL level at listening height. So in that case, we needed 90 dB at four feet. So we had to tap it at 28 Watts to get that 90 dB level at listening height. Make sense? So here's some advantages uh, also. Go ahead. Okay. So here's some advantages to a 70 volt system too. And remember I was talking about um, calculating your tap settings so that you know how big your amp channel needs to be. So if I've got uh, all my speakers lined up and I'm at 80 watt tap and I have a 100 watt amplifier on it, right? And all of a sudden the end user comes to you and says, ah, I forgot we need a speaker over here because uh, they need to be able to hear paging over here. Well, you can go, okay, I have a 100 watt amplifier um, that is a drive core. Now it's not every amplifier. Our drive core series amps, if you had to max out a channel, you still will be okay. So you can say, all right, I've got 80 watts on this amp channel and that's 100 watts. So I can add a speaker. And so it's literally just tap it off of the, the speaker run that you're doing and add it in there and just make sure it falls underneath that 100 volts. Um, now, in, in our drive core, our drive core amplifiers will at least do the wattage that we say it will. Um, drive core is very, um, uh, I want to say forgiving. Um, um, you typically, the standard in the old days was you wanted to leave 20% um, in your amps um, for uh, a lot of low end hits and things like that. Um, but in the drive core, uh, models that we have in our crown amps and our JBL commercial amps. Uh, a lot of it, we just leave that padding for scope creep. So that's a little food for thought. Um, let's talk volume adjustments. Uh, in the old days, we would actually do a, a volume pot on the wall that has a transformer in it. And we would come out of the amplifier and wire to that volume control for that zone. So one of the determining factors for a zone is when the customer says, I need to be able to control volume separately in here than over there. That is one way that you would say, okay, this is a zone because I need to volume control this differently than anywhere else in the building. Another thing too is when the customer says, um, I wanna be able to play Spotify in here, but I wanna be able to play DirecTV and whatever is on the game at the bar. That would also be uh, an indicator for you when you're qualifying a job to go, aha, that's a zone because they want to do something different from the other. Makes sense? So going back to the volume control, you would have a transformer on the wall with a pot and then you come out of that volume pot transformer um, and go to your speakers. Go ahead. Okay. Um, and then basically, by the time you go through that volume pot and get to your speaker, you're, you're not getting the five or 10 watts that you tapped at. So you lose a lot going through those volume pots. So today, in, in what we do, all of our volume controls are via CAT 5E or CAT 6 uh, connections. Um, so in our, in our uh, JBL commercial line, we ha have our volume, our CSRVs that will connect to any of our mixer amps or our, our amps. Um, so it's one volume per amp channel. Um, so on this one, you've got the CSMA four. it's a four channel input mixer with one amp. So you'll have one volume control. Um, in our zone pro, this is our DBX zone pros. Um, a lot of people don't know this, but these are the ZZ outputs. Um, there are two, um, you're able to do 12 
controllers in these in these uh, CZ outputs, six per port, and basically you just chain them. Um, so you come out uh, out of the Zone Pro into your first one, chain it from the second one to the third one, um, and so on up to six per port. And we also have hubs too. So if you wanted to home run all your Cat5 or Cat6 uh, there, you can connect them all to a hub, and then that hub will connect to one of the ZZ ports. Say that 10 times really fast. I can never get the ZC. It always comes out CZ. <laughs> anyway, I make myself laugh a lot. On the on our uh, BSS blue um, blue modules, these are our fixed frames. Um, you're able to do, if you've got the PoE switching, um, you can do pretty much unlimited as long as, as, long as you still have DSP um, memory available in the unit, you can just keep adding to it. So, um, and these are our Contrio controllers. They're really, really nice and they're easy, easy to program. It's basically, once you do your system design in BSS, you just drag and drop um, the volume controls and mute buttons onto the, onto the unit in the software. Makes it really easy. So, with every advantage to something, there's always a disadvantage, right? So, say you've got your zone one and you're playing music down it, and all of a sudden you're turning it up, but it's not getting loud enough, um, and you start turning it up more, and all of a sudden you start hearing distortion. Well, in, in a 70 volt system, when you hear distortion on one speaker, you're gonna hear it on all of them that are connected to the channel. So that is a drawback, which, which just makes us more cognizant of being able to design the system with enough headroom that you won't even go there. And then also our crown amplifiers, a lot of our amplifiers have DSP built into them so you can put in uh, limiting, um, which will limit at the voltage, um, which is what you want. Um, and then we also have high pass filtering and we also have speaker tunings that will um, help you protect the system better. So uh, insertion loss, like I said before, um, transformers technically, typically, uh, you know, will reduce the power. So anytime you hit a transformer, sometimes you you, you will be losing um, a loss. Every time you cut a cable, you you will and make a termination, you'll lose something. Um, so that's why this is a game of uh, like horseshoes. You gotta get it close and within range in order to win the game. Um, then that's that's pretty much the drawbacks. I mean, you when you design the system right with the right power and the right taps and do the calculation, this won't even be an issue. Another thing too, if you're using 16 gauge, use twisted pair. Basically, a twisted pair will automatically shed off noise, um, and any any noise that's in, in, induced actually will be phase canceled by the twist as well. So always, always, always use twisted pair. Um, never use Cat5 or Cat6 as speaker wire um, or audio wire, um, and and again, never use like um, just straight speaker cable. That's a, a huge no-no. I used to use the one on the left um, in my home stuff when I was a kid. That's the speaker wire we got at Radio Shack that we, in the rolls, and that's what we'd use. But twisted pair, big time. So we're, we're now getting into some be best practices, and I know we're running out of time, so I want to make sure I hit some of these. Mono to stereo. Basically, if you've ever listened to a Beatles tune in your car, you're hearing like vocals on the left and you're hearing instruments on the right, correct? So in a theater situation, um, in a commercial situation, if you use stereo in a restaurant and you're sitting on the wrong side of that Beatles tune, all you're gonna hear is instruments. Or if you're sitting on the other side, all you're gonna hear is, is the voices, right? So it's not desirable uh, for a commercial environment. So what you do is you're gonna have to mono sum it. So we have to think in terms of when you're doing a residential or like in our case, uh, we do a lot of Dolby Atmos uh, immersive rooms where stereo is key and we're, we have control over where the people are sitting. So when you're doing a concert, yeah, you've got a left and right speaker that can actually, because you know where your audience is sitting. 
In a restaurant, they're sitting everywhere. So you have no control over point and shoot, right? So how do we kind of get that same stereo sound without losing anything, right? So uh, this is where you get into mono summing, right? And, and these are some RDL things that I've used in the past where you, you want to be able to connect somebody's laptop or iPod or something to a wall plate and be able to have the left and right go in and be maintained. But what it does is it takes the left and right and sums it together. So you're still hearing the left and right feeds, but it's just being mono summed. Our products, we have this stuff built in. On our Zone Pro, you've got the white and the red RCAs. When you connect to S1, that is a mono sum. If you wanted stereo, you would go red S1, white S2, um, which we've done in the past where you've got a restaurant that's mostly 70 volt, but maybe you have a, a performance stage where you need to have stereo feed where the, the, the group that's playing on stage can connect their mixer to the house. Make sense? In our BSS, you would just drop in a summer inside the software. All right, I'm going to keep going here. So some key takeaways. Qualify the job. Don't be afraid to ask questions. Even if they sound stupid in your head, ask them because you never know what you can uncover when you're talking to your end users. Always start with your speaker design. Figure out what speakers... Um, what speaker or speakers are best for that solution based on ambient noise of the room and how loud does the customer want it. General soft background music or they want soft background music with a little bit louder at night. So you have to determine all that stuff. Um, and then use your bill of materials smartly. So don't try and give away the farm. Just give them what they need to know what their pricing is. Because at the end of the day, that customer is just going to look to the total. They're not going to really look at the minutia. So if you just make sure it looks reasonable and honest, you don't have to give them all the part numbers. Um, know the basics because you can use inverse square law to calculate uh, a stage, you know, where people are sitting. We have column line arrays and we have calculators for our column line arrays that can calculate within 4 dB from front to back of the room. Um, um, understand your speaker coverage, you know, um, know what, know what you need to do as far as in this environment, cause it's soft background music. Maybe I don't need to do a full overlap, maybe minimum overlap or even lower would be enough. Um, and then also call Tukes. If you have any questions or doubts, I'm happy to get on a call with you. I'm also happy to get on a call with you and your customer and help you qualify a job. I'm happy to help you learn how to, to design uh, systems. I'm not allowed to design them for you, but I can certainly teach you how to design like what we're doing today and, and what to do and how, how to not paint yourself in a corner because I've done it and I don't want you to do it. So, David. Yes. Um, how would you handle a certain situation where the particular venue uh, was not very acoustic absorptive and it's very, very live? Right. Uh, uh, what what normal practices would you tell your client uh, in a particular space like that, where you know you're going to have to get your distributed sound almost right on top of the customer? Mm -hmm. I would say sell the place and find a place that's more dead. No, I'm just kidding. <laughs> um, the, to add to that, there's also a lot of places that you're going to be going talk, talking to an end user where the, it's not even constructed yet. So how would you know what materials they're going to use? How would you know what the ambient noise of the room is? Um, start looking at, you know, simply what the materials they are using. You know, is it carpeted? Is it, is it concrete? Is it open, closed ceiling? Start looking for areas and places that you can put speakers so generally, what you're going to look at in a large reverberant room, you're going to be aware of where you're placing your speakers uh, to where they're not bouncing off of walls or bouncing off where people aren't. You have to look at trying to put the audio where the people are sitting. Think of it in terms of a, a flashlight, right? Um, audio is very similar to light in that it will disperse its audio the same as a flashlight. So the closer you get to that speaker or that flashlight, the more isolated and tighter, tighter that, that, uh, 
that audio or that light will be. And the further you get away, the more it's, it's a larger circle um, and, and almost flooding at, at the end of it. So the last thing you want to do is put in a speaker 20 feet above you that has uh, a conical coverage of 120 degrees, right? So if I'm putting a speaker 20 feet overhead, I'm going to look at something that's got a tighter pattern of like 60 degrees or even 40 degrees so that by the time it gets down to my listening height, now it's maybe only 90 degrees. Make sense? So you, you would look at your, your conical coverage um, based on that reverberant environment to put the audio where the people are sitting and nowhere else. So that's what you'd want to do. Does that, does that answer your question? Hopefully. <laughs> um, another thing, um, real quick, we're going to get into tools you need. An ohm meter is not good enough to test your system. You need to have an impedance bridge. Your impedance bridge will help you, especially when you're having a, an issue down the line. You've got 20 speakers on one amp channel and you're trying to find out which speaker is causing the issue. Um, an impedance bridge will help you determine that. Um, an easy way to do it is uh, um, put the impedance bridge on it. I'm going to speed up a little bit. We can go into detail one-on-one -on -one if you want to. Um, the impedance bridge will tell you what your ohms are and it'll tell you uh, exactly what's going on. If there's an issue, like a, there's a short, it's kind of like a needle in the haystack. Where, what speaker is causing the issue? So what you'll do is you'll walk down the line, listen and look, and if it, if it works, but it's much lower. So if you hear that speaker that's lower than the one, walk back a few, split your circuit there, do an, a, a bridge um, a reading again and see if that's good. Now you can start determining, okay, I'm good to hear, add one more speaker, do a, a meter reading there, and then you'll be able to find where that shorted out speaker is or that bad transformer could be. Make sense? It, it can be hard to, to troubleshoot a 70 volt system. Another neat tool, um, this is the TS-1A. Um, I know it looks like a phone, but it's not. It's actually a microphone and a speaker that you can connect anywhere. It does not need an amplifier. You just connect it right to it and you'll be able to actually um, talk into the headset and hear your voice out of a speaker so you can test to see if the speaker's even working. Um, it's a great tool. Th this is about 130 bucks on, on Amazon. It'll work up to uh, 500, I think it's 500, 500 watts. It'll work up to 440 volts too. So real quick, Harmon University. If you've not heard about this, Basically, go to Harmon University. We have over 300 courses that are completely free. You can start taking these courses now. We have BSS training. We have Crown training. We have Zone Pro training. Um, we have AMX training. Um, these are on online courses. And then once we get through all this mess that we're in right now, we will go back to our instructor-led courses. A lot of these are certifications. So when you get these certifications, it, it uh, uh, frees you up to be able to, to buy more of our higher end products. Um, there's also a uh, line array training on here. Um, so JBL has some really good online trainings too as well. And again, did I say it's free? It's totally free. I take these all the time. I think I'm about, I'm about 200 courses in on the 300. <laughs> so all right, really easy. Yeah, go ahead. We have a, I don't want to interrupt you, but we have a couple of questions real quick. Sound sure. quality, low Z versus high D. Ha ha. High D. I challenge you to hear the difference today. Um, I know that most manufacturers, I know Harman, we use nothing but really good, high quality transformers. And if you put, put those through our crown amps and set up your limiting and your uh, high pass filtering or low pass filtering, uh, properly to where that speaker is is the amplifier um, is only sending out the frequency range that the speakers can handle uh, you you will not be able to tell a difference um, 
I've I've had many 70 volt systems. People swear up and down that it was eight ohms, and it's not. Um, so in today's date, contrary to the 70s or the 80s, um, the transformers are high quality, and the speakers are are way um, uh, way better uh, designed and engineered. Um, our amplifiers are better producing. Um, you, you side by side, you wouldn't hear the difference. Okay, so I'm wondering, David, if you want to bring up sort of your contact information for everybody. This yeah. one? <laughs> that one there, exactly. That would be it. And we and have, again, I have, I love doing this. Okay, we had one person ask if there will be um, use case examples of the equipment by chance. Hmm. Do you have any of those? Hmm. I might somewhere. I'm trying to think if I do. Hmm. I might have some drawings of um, um, some some Zone Pro and some BSS systems if that would help. Um, email me and I'll get some stuff to you. Okay. I, I will have this. I will send you this person's. Uh, yeah, yeah. And don't picture. hesitate to take pictures of the screens too. If there's something you wanted to take a picture of that we already been through. So, um, now I will I will tell you that the pre-sale engineering, if you're going to need some sort of like video or control um, solutions, um, AMX or SVSI, hit that in, uh, that enterprise tech sales. If it's just audio, um, holler at me. Um, just email me directly. Okay. Well, I would like to thank everybody for participating today. We did go a little bit longer, but I think you guys had some good questions along the way. Yes. Um, I, the, I have recorded this um, session, and so I can make it available. It'll be available on our website at hermanproav.com, and you'll find it under webinars, and webinars is at the bottom of our page. Um, if there are any products um, that David mentioned or questions about ordering products, obviously, yeah. you're more than welcome to contact our sales team. Um, like I said, we have um, a full line of Harmon products, so please um, reach out to them. Absolutely. Don't let that phone be a wait. Pick it up and call us. We're here to help you. All right. Well, thank you very much.